from a devastating explosion to a diplomatic dispute with Mexico and a fast-tracked launchpad overhaul, SpaceX is now in full crisis recovery mode. Here's everything unfolding across Starbase. After the catastrophic explosion of Ship 36 at the Massey's test site, SpaceX lost its only operational facility for static-firing Starship upper stages. The damage was extensive, and even in the best-case scenario, repairs could take three to four months. While booster testing can still proceed at the orbital launch mount, SpaceX currently has no available platform to test Starships. To address this, the company is pursuing an unconventional workaround modifying the orbital launch mount, originally built for super-heavy boosters, to temporarily support Starship static fires. The first indication of SpaceX's plan came when a Starship transport stand, typically used to move upper stages around the production site, was rolled out and staged near the launch mount. Modification work began immediately, with crews cutting away the angled steel bracing on the stand legs, likely to reduce its footprint and allow it to fit within the OLM's central opening. At the same time, teams started dismantling booster-specific hardware, including all 20 super-heavy hold-down clamps, to clear the deck for the stand's installation. The full configuration of how the transport stand will integrate with the launch mount remains to be seen, and will become clearer as the rework progresses. However, this structural retrofit isn't the real challenge. More challenges lie in the fluid and electrical integration required to run a static fire on this adapted mount. SpaceX can't just use the booster quick disconnect since its interface is incompatible with the ship quick disconnect panel on the vehicle side. As a result, SpaceX will likely need to bypass the BQD entirely, manually route separate propellant and high pressure lines to the ship, and connect them directly to the SQD panel. Venting was observed from the launch mount Tuesday evening, suggesting that SpaceX may have already begun connecting the separate propellant delivery lines and is now testing them in parallel. Another layer of complexity involves software modifications. While the tank farm hardware, such as propellant feed lines, pumps, and vaporizers, remains the same, the fluid dynamics parameters differ between Super Heavy and Starship. Ships' tanks have lower volume and different pressure requirements. Therefore, the software that controls the valves, pumps, and flow regulation systems must be recalibrated to ensure that propellants are delivered at the correct flow rates and pressures. Once these hardware and software changes are in place, the system must be validated through cryogenic proof testing to ensure everything works before static fire testing. The first candidate for this unconventional campaign is Ship 37, which is currently inside Mega Bay 2, undergoing Raptor engine installations. Once ready, it will be tested on the launch mount, which will mark a significant milestone in preparations for Flight 10. Ship 38 will follow shortly after, first undergoing cryogenic proof testing on the same mount then returning to the production site for engine installation and a subsequent static fire. Although this process adds a few extra steps to Ship 38's path, both vehicles are expected to reach flight readiness around the same time frame, making it likely that Flight 10 and Flight 11 will both occur within a matter of weeks of each other. For Flight 10, Ship 37 will be paired with Booster 16, a vehicle that has already completed all pre-launch checks, including full cryo-proof and a multi-engine static fire campaign. Ship 38, meanwhile, will likely fly atop Booster 15, the same vehicle that was launched and later caught using the tower arms during Flight 8. Since Booster 15 has already proven itself under flight conditions, only a quick static fire test is expected before it can be cleared for Flight 11. However, that booster static fire must wait until the temporary Starship stand is removed from the OLM and the mount is reconfigured back to its standard booster-ready setup. While reconfiguring, testing, dismantling, and restoring the OLM will take time, it will still be significantly faster than waiting for Massey's to return to operation. This wouldn't be the first time SpaceX has reconfigured test infrastructure in response to situational constraints. Back in 2020, when Launch Mount was still under construction, SpaceX installed an adapter ring on suborbital pad A to accommodate early booster prototypes like BN3. That setup was used to conduct both cryogenic proof tests and full-duration static fires for the booster stage. If this plan succeeds, SpaceX stands to recover crucial ground loss due to the Massey's accident. More importantly, it allows them to complete final test campaigns for the last two Block 2 Starships, Ships 37 and 38, before shifting to the more advanced Block 3 design. Following the devastating explosion of Ship 36 at Massey's, SpaceX has begun the long and complex process of clearing the wreckage and rebuilding the site. Teams are currently focused on removing the widespread debris that littered the entire test zone. 
The removal of ship and Raptor engine fragments lodged in the flame trench will follow, and must be done carefully to avoid damaging the flame bucket. Once debris clearance is complete, Massey's can transition to reconstruction. The destroyed static fire stand will either be reconstructed or structurally upgraded, and a new gantry system will be installed. Damaged ground support equipment, such as propellant feedlines, pumps, and cryogenic heat exchangers, will be replaced. Although the main storage tanks survived the blast, they remain under inspection for structural breaches, leaks, or pressure integrity issues. Recent venting activity, likely involving liquid nitrogen flow, suggests ongoing tank integrity testing. If any tank is found irreparable, it will be replaced. As part of the rebuild, Massey's will be upgraded to support next-gen Block 3 Starship and booster testing, as the remaining Block 2 vehicles are currently planned for testing at the orbital launch mount, as previously outlined. For a detailed breakdown of the Ship 36 explosion, including its root cause and the full damage assessment, check out my previous videos linked in the description below. As SpaceX works to recover Massey's, a diplomatic challenge is unfolding across the border. Following the Ship 36 explosion, Mexican President Claudia Scheinbaum threatened legal action, alleging that debris crossed into the state of Tamaulipas and caused potential environmental harm. Given Massey's proximity to the U.S.-Mexico border and the blast's force, fragments could have traveled beyond the designated safety zone. Mexican authorities have launched a full environmental investigation, reviewing possible violations of international treaties and cross-border pollution norms. Legal proceedings are expected if evidence confirms environmental damage or regulatory breaches. SpaceX, in response, has denied any threat to neighboring regions asserting that all safety protocols, including exclusion zones, were properly enforced. However, the company acknowledged that debris recovery has been complicated by unauthorized trespassers entering private property, hindering cleanup. SpaceX has reached out to both local and federal Mexican agencies, offering assistance with recovery and environmental monitoring, and is prepared to allocate additional resources if required. Construction activities at Launch Pad B are progressing rapidly, suggesting the new launch complex may soon become operational. A key milestone is the ongoing installation of 20 booster hold-down clamps on the launch mount, designed to securely restrain the super-heavy booster during pre-launch operations. In parallel, integration of the dual booster quick disconnect systems is also underway. The first BQD hood was mounted onto the launch mount weeks ago, and the second is expected to follow soon. Meanwhile, the core BQD mechanisms are being finalized at the Sanchez site and will be transported to Pad B for direct integration with the launch hardware. Below the pad, teams are lining the flame trench with thick steel plates to protect underlying concrete and structural elements from the extreme heat and acoustic loads generated during booster engine startup. Meanwhile, upgrades to the nearby tank farm continue at full speed. SpaceX is installing new propellant pumps, cryogenic vaporizers, and control systems to support both pad A and pad B operations. Each component is undergoing individual testing in parallel to ensure calibration and readiness before going online. If current momentum holds, Pad B could be ready to support Starship Block 3 flight campaigns within the coming months. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. NASA's latest test of the new solid rocket booster for the Space Launch System rocket ended in failure due to a major anomaly during the firing sequence. Let's break down what happened and why it matters. The Booster Obsolescence and Life Extension, or Bull Booster, developed by Northrop Grumman, is a five-segment solid rocket motor designed to support future Artemis missions and extend the SLS rocket's operational capabilities. Standing two feet taller than the current version, Bull features a larger carbon composite case, carries more propellant, and delivers higher thrust and improved performance. Notably, it uses hydroxyl-terminated polybutadiene propellant, replacing the polybutadiene acrylonitrile used in existing boosters, offering better energy density and performance. Bull also introduces an electric thrust vector control system, replacing the hydrazine-powered system in legacy designs, along with a new, larger nozzle optimized for performance. NASA initiated the Bull program in 2018 to address the obsolescence of the shuttle-era boosters, which rely on refurbished hardware that will be depleted after the Artemis 8 mission. The first bowl equipped SLS flight is planned for Artemis 9, likely around 2034. The recent static fire test of Bolt was conducted at Northrop Grumman's test facility in Utah on June 26. The booster, mounted horizontally, was tested to evaluate thrust, propellant burn rate, thermal performance, and the functionality of the new case, nozzle, and electric thrust vector control system. 
The test proceeded nominally for the first 110 seconds of the planned 126 second burn. However, a sudden and violent nozzle separation occurred near the tail end of the test, resulting in an immediate loss of containment and a dramatic shift in the exhaust flow. The nozzle detached and was seen tumbling across the test range, leaving the booster's exhaust jet uncontained. Because solid rocket motors cannot be shut down once ignited, the remaining propellant continued to burn, venting uncontrolled from the aft end of the casing. Preliminary analysis suggests the failure originated in the nozzle joint, potentially due to structural or thermal overstress, possibly exacerbated by the new materials or elevated internal pressures unique to the bowl configuration. The event is now under thorough investigation using the extensive data gathered during the test. Northrop Grumman stated that future tests will proceed only after identifying the root cause and making design changes. Since Bowl is not scheduled to fly until later in the Artemis timeline, the failure is not expected to impact the current mission schedule. Japan marked a significant milestone in its space exploration history with the successful launch of the Global Observing Satellite for Greenhouse Gases and Water Cycle, or GOSA-GW, from the Tanegashima Space Center on June 28. The launch marked the 50th and final mission of JAXA's H-2A rocket, a stalwart of Japan's space program for nearly a quarter of a century. Following a smooth ascent, the satellite separated from the rocket's upper stage approximately 16 minutes after liftoff. It successfully entered a sun-synchronous orbit at about 666 km altitude and 98 degrees inclination, enabling consistent global observation under uniform lighting, essential for accurate environmental monitoring. GOSAD GW is the third satellite in JAXA's Greenhouse Gases Observing Satellite Series equipped with advanced sensors to measure atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases, along with global water vapor and precipitation patterns. Its mission is to improve understanding of greenhouse gas sources and sinks, monitor atmospheric changes, and supply critical data for refining climate models, evaluating emission reduction efforts, and supporting global climate agreements. The launch of GOSA GW also marked the end of an era for the H-2A rocket, which first flew in 2001. The rocket, developed in collaboration with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, has been instrumental in deploying a wide range of payloads, including Earth observation satellites, scientific probes, and missions to the Moon, Mars, and Venus. Over 50 launches, the H-2A achieved a 98% success rate, with only one failure in 2003, an impressive record for a medium-lift launcher. JAXA is retiring the H-2A in favor of the H-3 rocket, operational since 2023, which offers greater payload capacity, lower launch costs, and improved flexibility to meet the growing demands of exploration and commercial spaceflight. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.